founded Fetched It. I'm Jo Parrott, founder of the Ladies Working Dog Group, and I'm pleased you're joining us. We're all about diving into the fascinating world of gun dogs. Whether you're a beginner or have years of experience, there's something here for you. So get comfy and let's get this conversation started. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this very special episode of our Founded Fetched It podcast. We're not just celebrating another week of yes. working with our gun dogs today. We've yes. also reached a momentous milestone, our 100th episode. That's right, 100 episodes of sharing expert insights, breaking down barriers, and fostering a supportive community for all you incredible ladies and men out there. We've laughed, we've learned, and we've grown, and that's all thanks to you. And now what better way to celebrate by diving into a topic that's so close to our hearts? how to get the best out of our relationships with our gun dog trainer. So joining me for today's podcast are the amazing LWDG group experts, Claire Denya and LWDG mindset coach, Emma Dell. How are you both today? I'm very well, thank you, Joe. Lovely to see you both. I'm good and I'm looking forward to our 100th podcast. I can't believe it's been that many. Neither can I really. When I look back, I think, where has a hundred weeks of my life gone? How quickly did that happen? Um, and I think as well, we've covered so many amazing topics, and this is going to be one of those two. I want to start with the beginning of all training. So not just dog training, but training as a whole. So we go to school, we have a teacher for a subject. Um, we don't jump around teachers, we just have that subject. It's given to us that teacher, that subject. Um, and then we go to university, very similar. We're given the, the professor and they teach us. So then when we go out into the big wide world as hopefully functioning adults, we get choices in our like coaches and our trainers and our teachers. And there's all these different um, names we can give stuff. What is it that a dog trainer really is? Does that make sense? So as a professional dog trainer, the way that I see myself is as a coach. I don't do residential training. And so I see my role as educating the dog owner on how to train their dog and how to get the best out of their relationship with their dog and to hopefully um fulfill their dreams with their dog really and from a behavior side I see myself as somebody that's able to watch a dog's behavior and see how training and behavior are with that dog so you know does the dog have behavioral issues that are, are slipping into the training and just really to coach that owner through getting the best out of their dog and getting the training requirements that they've come to for me. And do you know what, as you were reflecting on that, Claire, I was thinking that that's quite interesting because obviously I have gone out and I have gone and got a professional gun dog trainer for my dog. Uh, and I was also reflecting on my role as a therapist, that kind of idea of, of kind of coaching as part of that. And everything that you were saying about people trying to get the best out of their dogs, I was thinking that's exactly the same for my clients. It's just they're humans. They're not furry. It's a very similar role about people coming to you because you have a skill set that they don't have and they want to learn and develop because obviously they don't just do the work in the session with you they carry on and take that work outside of the session you give them the tools and techniques and guidance and support for them to kind of do that in their own time to either develop themselves as a person if you're a therapist or hopefully develop themselves and their dog if they're if they're a dog owner so I think it's really similar. I think I think those expectations and, and why we go and see people who are professionals is for exactly the same reason, whether it's for our fairy four-legged companion or whether it's for ourselves. In the whole learning space, there are so many different names. Is this person a mentor? Is they, are they a coach? Are they a tutor? Are they a trainer? What are they? And as adults, we hopefully have the freedom of finance to say, well, I can go and see everyone and do everything. But listening to you both talk there, when you're talking about a consistency of journey, a, a journey you go on with your clients, I find it really hard to find how people can jump in and out of that journey. Does that make sense? So for me, um, let's say I was going to, I don't know, 
how to paint a horse's head random. I can go to 15 different trainers, tutors to work on that because I'm working on a very specific one tiny little thing and I can take all their perspectives into that one tiny thing. I don't see how we do that with a dog because we're not working on one tiny thing at a time, are we? So the way that I explain it and the way that um, when this question comes up, so very often when I take on a new client, sometimes I take on a new client and they've got a puppy. It's a very moldable little puppy and maybe they're a first time dog owner, maybe they're not. Um, But we start that journey together. Other times I take on clients where the dog is older, whether they've seen a previous trainer before me or perhaps the dog has got behavioural problems that need to be rectified so that they can continue the training journey. But the way that I explain it when them clients ask me my thoughts on this is I will say, if you've got a, a trained dog who understands what it is you're asking of it and you're a very confident handler and you're happy with the progress you've made with your dog and there are no behavioral problems or specific training issues that you're trying to work through or change or develop then if you've got that there can be absolutely no harm in attending training days that are very specialized to learn about something perhaps that your regular trainer, when I say regular, I'm talking more about your coach trainer. Um, Maybe they don't offer that or to proof some of what you've been learning with your trainer in a different environment or with a new group of dogs in in, in different environments Um, So that can be very useful. However, if you're working with a young dog who's learning or an adult dog who is overcoming perhaps some behavioral problems or training difficulties, you know, whatever they may be, to overcome those things and to get good, consistent results, there has to be a consistency in training. So if you move around too much when you are trying to work through problems or you are trying to change behavior patterns, I think it can be detrimental because the handler may be getting information from too many different people and giving a mixed message to the dog. So the dog then isn't getting a consistent message from their handler, which can be very confusing. At best, that's going to leave the dog more confused. At worst, it could bring up different problems that weren't there in the first place so I think it depends very much on why you want to do it and what your situation in that moment is with your dog and the journey that you're on with your dog I I agree and it's it's a really interesting thing and I think Joe probably said what I think is the theme word for this is consistency it's so critical um, you know, if 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 I was seeing someone for kind of two years for therapy and then I went on holiday, I wouldn't, my client wouldn't go, well, I want holiday for that weekend. So I'm just going to pop and see a completely different therapist for that one week and then I'll come back to you. They're probably more likely to wait. And and certainly from my experience coming into learning the world of gun dogs is I, I absolutely did exactly what Claire was saying. I didn't go to many trainers, but what I did is I looked at every single resource I could find <laughs> And whether that was stuff from the ladies working dog group and then I read a book and then I looked at a YouTube video and then someone else who I knew had a gun dog gave their opinion. And I sat there and went, I don't know. I just don't know. Like my mind is blown. Like, am I doing this right? One saying do this and I can see why that would work. And one saying do that and I can see why that would work. But they're both not going to work together. So I think sticking with one trainer, the same as sticking with one therapist, one coach, for a good long set period of time and if you need to go to another training day or you want to see a specialist in a certain area because your trainer doesn't provide that special have that communication with that trainer first about what would that look like why would that be beneficial because if I'm not consistent because I don't know what I'm doing with my dog the outcome is not going to be consistent it just isn't because my dog's going to be as confused as I am and I think and what I picked up from watching training weekends and I've really enjoyed absorbing that is that Actually, also, when our trainer gives us exercises, they they build on each other like building blocks. 
So my training might take me like, right, for a week, Emma, do this exercise to, I don't know, bring on your dog's point or bring on your dog's stop whistle. Because next time I see you, we're going to add this bit in or we're going to do that bit in. Now, if I only just focus on that and then go and see another trainer, they haven't seen that thought process, that that those building blocks. And they're going to go, well, why are you doing that? You need to do this. And and I think that's where that consistency and that full picture is really, really important. And that two-way communication, and it's got to be any coaching relationship has to be a two-way communication. Your trainer's not going to be able to read your mind unless you talk to them and you tell them. And and I think there needs to be a healthy respect from both sides. You know, you've got to respect your trainer's perspective and their point of view and 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 what they think is best. That's why you're going to see them. And vice versa, you need to give the trainer the right information to be able to work with you effectively. I think as well, though, like if you if you watch, um, and this is the industry as a whole, people don't like to tell one trainer they've been to see another trainer. So they're already hesitant about it as if they've done something wrong. And that's not to suggest that they have done something wrong, but they're already feeling awkward and not wanting to communicate about it, which suggests to me there's something in our own common sense says this isn't the way I need to be going about this. Like you just mentioned there, Emma, about like communication and respect. You know, for example, if I was going to go to Sam this week and I said, Sam, I'm going next week to Claire for a week. I've booked in a week. What do you want me to say to Claire we have been doing so that I, I can pass that information on so that Claire knows where we are and where we're going at? And can you tell me this? Can you tell me that? Now, I know Sam and Claire. They know each other. Sam will say, right, tell Claire, blah, blah, blah. In fact, Sam will probably pick up the phone and say to Claire, watch out because Juan is going to do this, 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 and this wrong. So there would be this, like, openness that would give, um, well, it, A, it take a lot of pressure off me. You both know about the other and understand. And I don't think trainers have an issue with you going to another trainer. I think it's when there's this breakdown and let's look at it a different way. I went to Sam. I didn't tell her about Claire. I spent a week with Claire. I didn't tell her about Sam. I go back to Sam and Sam's like, why is this dog in one week doing all these things he wasn't doing before? What have you done? Because the trainer can see that too, can't they, Claire? Absolutely. I mean, it does happen. But I just wanted to say that actually what you've just spoke about, I actually do. So there have been clients that have come to me and maybe they've travelled some way to come to me. And I know it's not practical for that client to come and visit me as often as required to get the result we want. Um, we we could, but it would take a hell of a lot longer. Um, and yes, I can do Zoom coaching calls in between sessions to keep people on track. But if I know that that client needs to see someone more regularly and I can recommend a trainer who I know has the same beliefs in training that I do and trains this in a similar way to me, because even the trainers that work very similar to me, we will ha all have our little quirks and differences. And that's cool. And that makes us unique. But I need to know that a trainer that I'm recommending my client to go and see for whatever reason is at least going to sing from the same hymn sheet as me. But I will actually say to that trainer, I've recommend so and so person come and see you. This is what we've been working on. This is what we're trying to achieve. The reason I would like her to come and see you is because she needs to see somebody more regularly than I can see her or something like that and we'll have that communication and that does happen and it happens regularly and I think you're absolutely right you said um some people don't want to tell their trainer but they need to because otherwise we might look at the dog in like two three four weeks time and go what's happened um and the handler's doing something completely different and we're like where did that come from? <laughs> you know? So that communication needs to be open. But equally, I will actually always be very honest. And if I think I can't help a dog, I will be honest and say that. If I meet a dog or a handler and I, and I can think, okay, I can't give this dog and handler what they need, I will say that. I'm not going to steal people's money. I will be honest and say that. And for me, I think I think it's a really good example. And I think there's two things that have come up for me as Claire was talking is one is I, I see two dog trainers. I see one very, very regularly. And then I have another one that lives much further away that exactly as Claire said, I couldn't go and see them 
every other weekend I wouldn't have that consistency but they both know about each other and they both work in a very very similar way one just has a specialism that the other one freely admits they don't have you know they have a good skill set in that area but that's not their area of specialism so and they and I'll say right I'm going to go off and see this trainer and they go okay cool that's fantastic we'll come back how did it go it's a very very open relationship and there's two bits that came up for me as Claire was talking is I think one is people don't want to admit as joe said that they've gone to see another trainer or maybe they're seeing another trainer they feel like somehow it's cheating on them in some way shape or form or is actually they're making it more difficult because the trainer's now just confused or and i think what's even even more interesting and it's something that when i take on a new client i will say to them have you had any previous therapy elsewhere what was it like and what was what was good about it and what wasn't good about it because how come you've ended up with me and it'd be interesting claire i don't know whether you do the same when you take on a new client and have you been to any of the trainers and what was your experience? Because actually, probably a lot of people, and I'm guessing here, Claire, but tell me if I'm wrong, won't admit that. And you don't know what their previous experience is until X weeks or months down the line, where they suddenly go, do you know what, four weeks ago, I saw this trainer and, and, and actually had a really bad experience. And, and you need to know that because you can work with that with that client, you can work with that moving forward. So I think and I think they often there's a sense of shame, or they feel like they're doing a disservice or something like that. But if you're going to work with anybody, whether it's for a therapy point of view or a dog training point of view, you need to know the full picture. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to do your job effectively. Yeah, I do. And I get a mix, actually. So (laughs) uh, some people will tell me the whole story straight away, like tell me everything. And And it gives me very valuable information that will help me help that client get what maybe they couldn't get and it could just be down to their personalities didn't match right sometimes it's not the training um or anything like that it's just they don't gel maybe they just don't click sometimes it's the training methods sometimes it's that the dog isn't making progress um there are a multitude of reasons but some people will blurt it out to me on that first session or even before I've met them over the phone perhaps um other people it doesn't come out till much much later and usually when I do a bit of digging so I will see something happening with the dog and I'll start to try and unpick what I'm seeing and work out why the dog is behaving in a certain way And I will say, is there any history of this? Has this ever happened to the dog before? Have you had this experience? And then the story might come out later down the line. I think sometimes that can be down to, as you said, um, sometimes it can be down to maybe their confidence in telling you or they feel ashamed that they didn't achieve before. Um, But... Val- any information for me is valuable information very often the things that I don't get told when they do come out I'm like if I'd known that four weeks ago <laughs> that would have been amazing but I think I think what people maybe underestimate and maybe all trainers aren't the same I don't know for me there's a massive investment of my knowledge and my caregiving is that is that maybe what I'm trying to say when I invest in a client when they're investing in me in coming to me and paying me for a service I invest and I suppose it is emotionally but not in an unprofessional way but they will get my all they will get my everything and so you have to be able to communicate effectively with that client to get results because I heavily invest and I will be totally honest. And if if something's happening and I can't unpick it or I can't work out why, I'll be very honest about that. But consistency in the training, I think, is the thing. And I mean, my clients must think I bang on about this all the time because I really do. And it's like I sort of say to people, to see change, you've got to consistently train this behaviour for at least four to six weeks for it to start to become a new ingrained behavior for the dog and then you've got to proof it so that's without even the proofing stage that's just the teaching phase I don't know many dogs that really fully understand something and it becomes an ingrained behavior much much quicker than that I look all right like 
Meg goes to an online school now, and as soon as she started, it was like, if Meg doesn't like the teacher, tell us, we'll change her. And I was like, sorry? If this, and they're like, if she doesn't understand their accent, if she doesn't connect, tell us, we change it. And there was like a huge, well, it was just a big massive breath of fresh air because you could never have gone back to mainstream school. And I'm not having to go to mainstream school. They don't have the facilities or the capacity to it. And say, Meg doesn't like this teacher. Can you give me a, a different teacher? So that was a breath of fresh air in itself. But also, in a school, uh, she's doing a GCSE, they are training to a set curriculum. Every single teacher in the UK teaching biology knows what our biology syllabus looks like, what the exam at the end is going to look like. So they can all work on the set plan. And I think within dog training, there is no set plan. There is no set plan. Definitely in gun dog training, there's no set plan. So without this honesty, how is any trainer meant to know where you were trying to take that dog yeah and i think i think that's it's such an interesting concept i know claire will have some great input on this around the idea of when i go to see a dog trainer what i would like my dog to do will probably be different to a lot of the other clients that go and see their dog trainer some people might go and see their dog trainer because they want to trial their dog some people just want to have a really well behaved dog and they like doing the pet gone dog stuff and they're never going to have their dog near game or anything like that they just like doing the work and they find it really enjoyable other people want to see their dog working on a shoot some people want their dog to beat some people want their dog to pick up some people want their dog to do both if they can do it so again going to your trainer and and going this is what I actually want to do with my dog rather than the trainer making the assumption of Emma wants to trial her dog is going to be really key it's the same thing if when I when I see a client for the first time to therapy I'm like how will we know therapy is successful and and, and they kind of look at me like what and I'm like well how will we know that we're doing our job properly like is it, are you going to be less anxious are you going to you know have decided about I don't know a career for you like how are we going to know it's successful and I think for me, when I go to my trainer, I want to be really clear about what I would like the end goal, ideally. And we don't always get there. Like Every dog is different. But ideally, the end goal, not for that session, but long term, what I'd like to do with my dog. Because then my trainer can tailor what they're doing to what my needs are rather than what they think I should be doing. And isn't part of that, though, like we're talking about, like, how do we get the best of our trainers? And so far, we've covered, like, clarity, communication, respect, agreement on training methods, discussing the investment that you're both going to put in emotionally, financially, time-wise. But now we're getting on to other things now, like goals. People don't always start their job training with the end in mind. Like that's how I teach goal setting myself. I say start with the end in mind. If you are new to dog training, especially gun dog training, you have no clue what the end looks like to even know what the goals are. So from that point, we need to take some leadership or some uh, information from our trainer and know that they do know the course, they do know the way, and we have to trust them to take us that way, don't we? 100%. And I think not only that, sometimes the goals change. As the handler, the dog owner's, uh, ambitions will grow as their knowledge grows and as they see success and as the dog does things that they perhaps never dreamed their dog could do it's suddenly doing it at that point the goal post changes so again that comes back to communication when that goal post changes so an example of that for me would be John and I we do teach all round gun dog training and I suppose we specialize more in retriever breeds because that's what we own and that's what we've worked with for the longest but we know how to teach a spaniel all of the behaviors and all of the intricacies that they require to be a beating dog or to do spaniel tests the same for HPRs we know how to teach the logistics of how to teach that dog to hunt up and how to get it to sit on the whistle and stop at distance and all of those things but if I had a client with a HPL breed and the dog was coming on really really well and they started saying I think I might want to compete 
at that point, I will be really honest and say, I have never competed at that level with a HPR breed. So if you want to take that to trialing standard, you know, to that level, I would recommend they went to see a specialist in that area. So that's me then handing over the reins and saying, I've got you this far, your dog's super capable, it's brilliant. But if you want to take that next step, you might want to go see that specialist trainer. But then I've had clients say, but I don't need to because you've taught the skill set and my dog's out there winning working tests. And I'm like, fair point. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I always am very honest. And I think, again, this comes back to integrity and honesty as a trainer in that that's not my specialist area. I can teach you the skill set. But if you want to go beyond that, you know, you're going to perhaps want to consider doing them. So I think it works both ways it work it really does work both ways but i think i love when a client's goals move up because that means we're achieving if i don't really want my client's goals to ever come down unless they go actually i tried it and i hate it and i don't want to do it that's completely different but for me success is when the client's goals go up to the next level and i'm like okay this is cool this is very cool and I think that's about confidence. I think it is. It's about and I and I think what was really lovely you said early on about you giving your rule is that 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 relationship with a client, any coaching relationship, we often forget that yes, the client is paying for a service, and I think the client also forgets we want those dogs to succeed. Like even in therapy, I want my clients to succeed. I want to see them develop and grow, and so there is an emotional investment from me. And, and like you said, it's around those professional boundaries of an emotional investment, but it's still an emotional investment. And and I think sometimes when people feel like they're paying for a service, they forget that there's there's that prep time. I'm thinking about what I'm going to do. I'm thinking about, you know, you'll be thinking about your dog. Where am I going to go with that? How am I going to bring that on? There is all that. You're a team and your trainer is part of that team. Um, and I very much in my training always laughs and jokes about my dog in a, in a very lovely, supportive way, just to be very clear if he ever listens to this. But it, we are a team. Both of us are sitting there working out the dog together. So I'm giving him information, as much accurate information as I can give them. So he can use his expertise to make an informed opinion about what to try next. And I think it is still trial and error. You're not going to guarantee it's going to work. You're going to go, right seen this with the dog let's give this a go and I saw Claire you know only recently going let's just try that and that's not because that's because Claire's seen something and she's like this might work this could work so it is it's a collaboration there's three of you in that relationship there's the dog hopefully getting the positive outcome there's the client that's coming and being honest and open with the trainer even if it's like Do you know what in the last three weeks I've done nothing because my life has fallen apart and I'm a bit of a mess which is often what happens I'm sure Claire is a therapist as well as a dog trainer half the time and there's also the trainer coming in with their expertise, their skill set and their passion. They do it because they want to do it. So it's got to be that three way relationship. And all of you come in it with passion. You want your dog to do well. Your trainer wants your dog to do well and your dog wants to do well. I think that's absolutely amazing what you've just said there, Emma. And absolutely, I think clients perhaps don't understand what goes on outside of their session to prepare for their sessions. So for me... Um, whether it's group classes or one-to-ones, I have a class plan, but that class plan has to be moldable and flexible to the dog's needs and the handler's needs. But I have to feel prepared. So I write notes into the calendar of what we did last time. I write notes when I get home, like a little debrief, so that when I am due to see them the next time, the night before, I usually review the notes from the last session and think right let's put together a little class plan with the mindset in my head at that point that I'm hoping the dog has become consistent or even grown but then although I prepare that class plan so that I have an idea of what I'm doing on meeting that client for the next session when I meet them I'll ask how things have been going and I'm fully prepared to adapt to that session and change that class plan accordingly 
if that dog isn't ready for the progression. But I think off of the back of that, so that's a lot of time outside of the session time in pre-planning, in debriefing with myself. Sometimes John and I will sit together and I will say to him, I had a session with a client today and we've been doing this technique and it's working really well. Um, but when I try to move on to the next step, I noticed this and I'll ask his advice, you know, what would you have thought of in that moment? And so that's great for me because I've got another trainer who trains with the same mythology and the same um, techniques that I do to bounce ideas off of, which I know I'm very, very lucky to have that. Um, but if he wasn't there, I'd sit there thrashing it out in my brain. <laughs> like, like, okay, so I need to try X, Y, and Z. But that brings me always back to working with the dog in front of me. And, but, that might mean I need to change tact with that dog, but I can only change tact with that dog if we've given enough time, patience and consistency to the thing we're working on to see if it really is going to work, which takes weeks, not days, not hours, but weeks of consistent training. So I think this always then comes back to that thing of we work with the dog in front of us, but equally, so if something goes wrong twice in a session, got to change it. That's always my thing. You would have seen that a lot, Emma, over the weekend. <laughs> um, with, you know, it's gone wrong twice. We need to immediately change something. Otherwise, a pattern of behavior is starting to develop that I don't want them. But equally, knowing that a technique is going to take a lot longer than just a session or two to become a new ingrained behavior. So it's having that flexibility, yet having the braveness to be consistent enough to try. If I play devil's advocate a little bit now, go back to Meg. If Meg said to me, oh, I don't like teacher A, and I said, right, and I contact the school and they give her teacher B, and she doesn't like teacher B, and she doesn't like teacher C, then at some point I've got to go, well, hold on, Meg, is the teacher the issue? Or are you the issue because you don't want to do the work? Because there has to be some responsibility on us as the learner to, to do the work, isn't it? You can't put it all on the trainer. So I think there's a little part of that in there, is that when we're saying how do we get the best from our trainers, we have to give them time to help them to train us to train our dog. Uh, yeah. 100% I agree on this one and 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 sometimes that's really hard because we either go one way or the other we either tend to blame ourselves for everything and actually it's not and actually it's a combination of number of factors or we can sometimes when something doesn't go to plan we get quite defensive about it uh, and that can be really hard and I think that can sometimes really rupture the relationship between yourself and your coach um, and I say that from kind of my skill set rather than Claire's is that it, it is about that consistency and it's about that honesty and it's about that if you if you weren't consistent you can be honest about that that you won't be the first person you won't be the last person that comes back and goes I did nothing because I wasn't able to do it but it's about understanding that yes sometimes there isn't the right fit and and I would say a relationship with a coach in whatever way shape or form whether it's a dog trainer or a therapist is quite an intimate one because you're going there and you're quite vulnerable because you're you're willing to get things wrong in front of them. You're willing to mess up. You're willing to have this journey with them. And and so it, it is quite an in-depth relationship. And and sometimes what happens is it, it's, it becomes hard for us to feel honest in that. And so what we do is we kind of withdraw. We go, well, it, it, it must be it must be the trainer or it must be it must be something else. And I think also on top of that, we live in a society, this is me getting very briefly on my safe box, but bear with me on this one, where we're used to getting things instantly. We're used to getting instant gratification. We're used to, if I order something off Amazon, it arrives tomorrow or sometimes even the same day, depending where I live. You know, if I am unwell, I want to go to the doctor and I want to get medication. I don't want to be prescribed a health, a lifestyle change. I want to get a pill to make myself better. And that's no one's fault. And it's great in some ways that these things have accelerated and speeded up because, do you know what, if I want to get a book on dog training, it'll be here tomorrow. And that's really exciting for me or, you know, all of those other things. But what it does mean is that element of patience and consistency 
we're not used to and there's really good things and most of us you're probably going to laugh at this point if you're listening to this podcast most of us can't even watch a half hour tv program without being on our phone and we don't even realize we're doing it because we're not used to that element of concentration research shows that are not our memory but our concentration is now less than that of a goldfish that is a true fact that is a true fact of us as humans because of this overstimulated society that we have through phone social media getting stuff here and now and so when it comes to something which takes time and I could feel almost my internal eyes roll when Claire was going it will take weeks because I'm thinking oh yeah it does is that I'm going to struggle with that most humans will struggle with that because we live in a world where everything is instant so when something does involve weeks and weeks of effort it's not necessarily because we're lazy it's just we're not used to it the reason I can't be unemotional about the relationship between me and my client and their dog is because it takes as we know around two years to train a gun dog you develop a very strong professional but very strong relationship with somebody that you're seeing once a fortnight which is the average I see the majority of clients you know some are more frequent some are far less frequent but I would say it's an average of every two weeks for a couple of years if they're doing the full journey from begin, from puppy or beginner gun dog right through to a working dog. That's a lot of time and emotion and investment and care and consideration into that person and their dog. Um, so to keep that professional, it's not difficult to keep professional, but it's difficult not to emotionally invest yourself in that person and their dog because when you when you are that connected to somebody and they're having to share everything with you and you grow to care about that dog almost as if it was your auntie's dog <laughs> in fact i think actually i actually love my clients dogs more than my auntie's dog probably <laughs> but <laughs> because i see it a lot more so you know I think this is where I think it's maybe clients don't understand how emotionally invested a coach trainer gets with the dog. And probably that's not the same for a trainer who um, a trainer who perhaps just has groups come in, sees them a couple of times a year, throws the dummies around isn't actually putting that effort into class planning, into debriefing, into problem solving. I think it's very, very different on that side of the the scale. I was taught once, and I think um, it is actual fact. I don't know where it is. I'll find it somewhere. But it is. It takes ten thousand hours on average to become an expert in anything. So if your um, clients were going to come and see you once a fortnight. For two years, let's say they let's say they saw you fifty times, and they trained in between. Say they've trained six hundred hours. Then six hundred hours, they're still not the ten thousand hour expert. Whereas if you look at the hours and hours and hours and hours and hours a trainer spends on the field, it doesn't take them as long to get to that ten thousand hour expert. But I also think what we see, we don't give ourselves time. I know for certain, for a fact, I don't give myself enough time. I think I should know it all by now. Um, but also, as an entrepreneur, I really struggle with like shiny object syndrome. I love the job I've got. I love my business. Then I see somebody else doing something else. And I'm like, oh, I'd love to do that. Oh, I'd love to do that. And I have to really, really focus on not getting distracted from the business that I do. And, and it, it takes some serious amount of time. I'm sure the ladies um, in the LWDG will know when I'm having this shiny object moment because I'll suddenly bring out a new T-shirt because I just needed to leave that creativity out somewhere else. But I think with Gendo trainers, it is almost that shiny object trainer. It's like, ooh, I'm going to see this trainer. Ooh, I'm going to see this trainer. And it's lovely in one way and it's cute and respect for the hours they've put into training. But for you as the person flitting around the country, I don't know if it's always the best way to go about it if you're not solid in your own beliefs first. Yeah, absolutely. And um, and I was just reflecting as, as Claire was talking about seeing people fortnightly and I was thinking, that's absolutely right. I see my gun dog trainer more than I see my family. So why would I not? I see them more than I see my mum and dad. So why would the relationship not build in that way? Now, I'm not saying I'm closer to my trainer than my parents, but 
I see them very regularly and and therefore they we we do share that hour where we're talking about the dog and what we're doing and a bit about life and what I've been up to because that's related to the dog so so yes that that relationship Claire I think is 100% normal if you're seeing that someone that regularly you're going to build a relationship with them and their dog shiny object syndrome Joe yeah 100% I'm one of those people and I think part of that for me um is about is about trying to find a quick solution so and and I see this and I, I I was laughing when I went to the weekend about I don't think there's ever been a time where I've gone to either like a simulated shoot day or a gundo training weekend where I haven't left buying something um and that will either be a bit of clothing because I'm like oh well what are you wearing that looks really good and it's nice to be able to do that because you can get a review can't you about whether the clothing is good or not but also gun dog stuff and and part of it's because I like shiny new stuff and it's exciting, isn't it? If we get something new for our dog and we generally tend to buy stuff more for our dogs than we do ourselves. But if we're really honest, sometimes it's because we're looking for a solution that maybe consistency would give us. Like if I only just get this amazing dummy, he'll retrieve it. And sometimes, yes, that dummy will help. If my gun dog trainer said, look, try this. Actually, this dummy might be a better fit. Or, or actually, we've tried something during the session, which has worked really well. And in the rare occasion, which for me is rare, that I don't have one of those dummies already at home, because that's my admission of, of what I spend my money on, is that sometimes we think, well, actually, it's the kit. It's the kit. When actually, and Claire's probably going to confirm this now, is that it's probably me and it's my consistency with the dog. It's probably not the kit. But we always look for that solution. Maybe this lead will make it better. Maybe this dummy will make it better. Well, I've never heard of the shiny object thing before. So thanks for that, because I've just learned that tonight. So that's great. Absolutely. I think the thing is, very often that does happen. And it does really, really happen. So I will get out something out of my reluctant retriever bag. I have an actual reluctant retriever bag with things that I've used over the years. So I've been doing this professionally now for, it's going into eight years now. So that bag's pretty full of a lot of stuff. But the reason that bag is so big is because every dog I see teaches me something new. So when I put that into what you just said, Em, about this thing for this, I'm like, okay, so if I see on average, John and I see between us in a week, an average of 60 dogs a week. That's a lot of dog time, right? So if I think about the amount of different problems I see in that time, no wonder my kit is so big. But that one article might have worked with half a dozen, maybe more dogs. And with some of those, do those dogs, it might have worked very quickly. And with other dogs, it may have taken longer and taken a lot more hard work. Uh, and with others, that piece of kit wouldn't work at all. So then I need another item in my toolkit. And when I'm talking about toolkits, Sometimes it's a technique. Sometimes it's a command or a cue. Sometimes it's body language. Sometimes it's um, a reward system that the dog values. Sometimes it is actually a physically tool, whether that be a tennis ball wrap or a reluctant retriever dummy or any of those things. But it's finding the fit for that dog. But still, I don't think... It's very, very rare, and I can't think of the dog of, of a dog off of the top of my head where we've introduced something and the problem is fixed in a week. Like if I'm working with behavior cases, behavior modification, yes, I can. But in gun dog training, because the dog has so much more freedom, because they are out there and you're over here and anything ha can happen between them and you. The consistency in the training and the technique and the body language and the verbal cues or commands and the whistle commands um, and the piece of equipment you're using. That's a lot of things to get consistency on, isn't it? Whilst you were talking then, I just sort of like did the rough calculator things. I'm, I'm not brilliant at maths. And for you to do 10,000, you said you see 60 dogs a week, so roughly 60 hours. Um, you have out training your own dogs. I know you've done courses, etc. Say you did like 80 hours a week, right? It took you three years to hit expert level. You've said yourself you're on what, like eight? Either what you've amassed, when we're looking for a gun dog trainer and we're looking how to get the best out of our gun dog trainers, this, I think, is something as owners we should question for you to understand if you're going to go to somebody, A, you've got to trust them in the first place and trust comes from them showing you evidence in their ability to do it. 
So I think another thing that maybe makes us jump around might be that we just don't have confidence in the trainer we've got. So is that a case of we've chosen the wrong trainer or we've just not asked them enough questions for us to build trust in them to begin with? Well, that's real food for thought, that. Real food for thought. Sometimes people feel they need somebody who's... So, okay, so, okay, let me put myself on a on a little... What do you call it, like? Um, guillotine. <laughs> put myself on a guillotine. I don't think that's what I mean. But maybe you'll work it out from what I'm going to say. Um, not a podcast goes past, does it, where I don't get a word wrong. I think because sometimes... Sometimes I believe that some clients, perhaps, because I'm not big in the competition world, maybe think that I don't have credential in that area. But as I touched on earlier, it's about training a skill set to achieve that. Just because working tests and me just don't seem to gel very well, doesn't mean I can't train the skill set doesn't mean I can't read the dog, doesn't mean I can't see what the dog needs, doesn't mean I can't see what the handler is doing and how they could change what they're doing to get a better result. So I'm not sure if I did just put myself in a guillotine or not. You ladies might need to put me straight on that. But I think sometimes that might be, instead of thinking this person can teach me can coach me, can see what's happening with my dog and, tra- and train the skill set. Maybe they don't look at... And and I think that's it's a really interesting idea because I do think that happens in the dog training world. Like, what has your trainer done? What has your trainer won? What has your trainer got? Whereas actually, if you think about... So one of the analogies that I use is the, the people that have, let's say, for example, won Wimbledon tennis, let's go down that avenue, they don't always become tennis coaches. In fact, very rarely they do. In fact, the tennis coaches that are out there often haven't won Wimbledon, but they know how to get someone there because they have the knowledge, the skills, the understanding and the ability to watch and notice. And I think that's what's so key about a coaching role is you can watch and you can notice. So, for example, when someone comes to see me as a therapist and I specialise in trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder, they don't say, well, do you have PTSD and what traumas have you had growing up? But that doesn't mean I can't treat somebody for it because I understand I understand the knowledge the skills I've had specialist training in that area to be able to support someone through that so for me I think it's a really bizarre concept to go in and say right you have to have done what I have done to get me there like I think having some experience and knowledge is great but otherwise I'd be very limited with the clients I could see as a therapist because I'd have to have had the same and I won't have had the same experience so even going even further so say for example Hilary is amazing at trialing her dogs and I've gone to see her because I want to trial my dogs but my dog will be different to Claire so what Claire won her field trial with will be different to what she has to do with me so even if she does have the experience she doesn't have the experience with my dog and my skill set and my ability and my knowledge she just doesn't have it so I don't think we can go and say when we're talking about about kind of that that role that relationship that you have that you have to have done exactly the same thing. You just have to have the understanding, the skill set and the awareness and the ability to watch and learn to be able to coach someone through that. I sometimes think that somebody who's exceptionally good at something can be shockingly bad teachers, like shockingly bad, because they're instilled in their way of doing it. They've developed and worked and become an expert in their methodology. This This is how I train my dogs. And they can produce... Beautiful, beautiful dogs following their methodology that makes sense for them, that works for them. And then, you know, I come along, fraggly little me, and say, help me. And I'm nothing like them. And, like, I saw this with my dad. My dad would try to explain something to me, and I'd be like, I don't get it. And he'd be like, well, what don't you get? Just do it. And I was like, yeah, but what am I doing? And he's like, well, just do this. And I was like, they're not getting it. And he was like loggerheads, right? And I think that frustration wasn't helpful um, because he didn't understand why I didn't understand something that was like child's play to him. And I didn't understand why he didn't understand that I didn't get it. And then in all I missed of like that confusion was a small dog, a small pup who was like, I'm not even knowing what's meant to be going on here. So it was, it was a recipe for disaster. Now that's not saying 
that like the top of the game can't teach, of course they can. But I think to be top of your game and be a good teacher is a very, very rare thing. I, I absolutely agree. And I think because actually having the skills to be able to communicate, impart knowledge, build a relationship and do that in a really caring, supportive way where that person doesn't feel put upon, criticised, afraid. And we see so many women and I get messages from women about times where they've had horrific experiences with all sorts of different trainers. And again, they might be amazing at what they're doing. But they're maybe not that great at the people skills. And I think being a coach or doing some form of training, you have to have really good people skills. You have to have that ability to be able to encourage, grow, shape and work with somebody rather than feeling like you're enforcing something or telling somebody or judging them. And I think that's the difference. I think being able to do something really well and being able to explain what you're doing to somebody else really well are very different things and like you said joe there is an overlap there are some people that are fantastic at what they do and are fantastic at coaching and explaining it to other people but that's not everyone i agree with everything you've just said i think there are some people that are top of their game who are very good coaches as well um but not all and i do get lots and lots and lots of inquiries from ladies and messages from ladies and men actually but probably more ladies, if I'm honest, whom the trainer has said, this dog will never get it, or it's too much dog for you, or, you know, in different hands, this dog would be amazing, or the breeding isn't right for this dog to do it, and they would move that dog on. So what you're saying, Joe, is absolutely right. With a certain type of dog, that method, that technique works. And if it doesn't, it's the dog's fault in a lot of those cases. And that can be very difficult for the sort of clients that I see, the majority of the clients I see, they're not going to move their dog on. It's their pet first and foremost. It lives with them and they want to aspire to do things. And maybe there are limitations because of the dog's breeding or its genetics or whatever but that doesn't mean that that owner cannot achieve amazing things with that dog and they shouldn't be held back from that but it's also the ability to understand how the owner learns like that's why I will make an absolute fool of myself on the field doing actual demonstrations of how to do something Um, because some people are visual learners some people need it written down so I might write them down the step-by-step guide some people can listen and absorb it and I think that's where being a really good coach is useful to really understand how that person learns as well as being able to read the dog and understand the dog and troubleshoot I mean it's quite a big role when you really break it down like that it's huge I'm gonna say something that probably it's not controversial at all but I think is really useful is that when when we train as a therapist we train in a modality right so I, I see that as akin to um, being a, a trainer and going, oh, I want to specialise in spaniels. OK, so you train in a modality. So that's that's most of the work that you do, the knowledge in and that you know about. You can treat other stuff and you can work with other stuff and that's great. But you specialise in a certain type of therapy. Um, and and around that, there is this idea and you, you almost get fractions of people. And you see this in the therapy world and I'm sure it's the same in the gun dog world where they almost end up against each other of like, well, my therapy is better than your therapy. And my, you know, this, my way of doing it is better than your way and and that kind of stuff. But actually the clinical research, and that's what I like looking at. I like research. I'm a bit of a geek when it comes to that shows. It doesn't matter the type of therapy you have. The success that you get with your client is based on your client therapist relationship. Now it doesn't matter whether I'm person centered, psychodynamic, humanistic, all those other weird therapy terms that we have out there. Actually what matters is how I come across to my client the relationship we build the communication we have and the work we do together and this is my controversial bit I would say that that's exactly the same in gun dog training I think yes you have to have the prerequisite training and skills and understanding but having the best relationship you can with your trainer is going to get the best out of you best out of your trainer and best out of your dog I can remember not long after I had my um, first tumor removed they sent me to see a counsellor and this counsellor sat, I was falling apart. I was like six weeks after 
my operation, my world had exploded. And he sat there and told me all about how his cancer had affected his life and how miserable he was. And I was like, you, my friend, are not the right counsellor for me. I don't think he was the right counsellor for anyone, to be fair. But I just thought, you are really not what I need right now. So to like bring this back, I realised we've like told for over an hour. This is going to be a long podcast. I'm sure your dog's ready to go home now, those of you who are listening as you walk. In order to get the best out of your gun dog trainer, You've got to take on board all the things that um, our amazing ladies have said so far. You've got to be finding a trainer who can teach. There's got to be communication. There's got to be respect. There's got to be an agreement on what your training method is going to be. There's got to be open communication and discussion about what they possibly could be. Because like we said, we don't know what your goals are, what your small goals are, what your milestones are. We need to put all those type of things into place. You're investing financially and your time in it and they are, and your emotions and they are doing the same. So there really has to be trust and a relationship built on both of you working on the dog in front of you. And I think there needs to be a lot of professionalism and a lot of respect on both sides. You need to give your trainer the respect they deserve. And I'm hoping, and like my cancer man, that they are giving you the respect you need as somebody there to learn in front of them. Is there anything I have left out of that list, ladies, that you think somebody needs to have in order to get the best out of their trainer? I think for me, um, I think honesty, I think honesty about, you know, you have to be honest about what you're dealing with. You've got to be honest about what, what you can do, the time you can invest into your dog, be realistic with your trainer, be realistic about the dog. And their behaviour, I think certainly there's times, I'm sure Claire's seen it, where actually they're saying one thing, but the dog's doing something else. So that level of honesty and go into it open. You know, it was lovely to hear Claire talk about how much she invests in her clients. It's a two-way street. And, and, and as I kind of just said before, it is all three of you are a team surrounding, you know, all together. You know, there's both of you as a team with this dog in the middle all wanting the same thing. You want to succeed. Your dog wants to succeed. Your trainer wants you to succeed. But you need to have all the information possible to give to your trainer to get the best out of that relationship. I think just from the trainer perspective, do listen to the trainer. Take on board all the advice you're given and and be realistic about the expectations and and the time, the patience, the consistency to get the result. And if something isn't working, be super honest with your with your trainer because if you have got a trainer who really is your coach, they will then give you another thing to try. They will be able to think outside of the box to get you and your dog where you want to be. Well, thank you, ladies. It's been another fascinating one. Um, both the ladies who have chatted with us tonight have both uh, read our forthcoming book. And I think they will both agree that a lot of the stuff we've touched on tonight, you'll find the elements of it in the book as well. So it might be something to go to if you want to read more, understand more, and use it to keep on building on the knowledge that these wonderful ladies are, have already given you and do give you week in, week out. As it is our 100th, podcast anniversary um we would like to do a free giveaway we're going to give away a founded fetched first ever cap oh my god the excitement is unbelievable go to instagram go to last ladies working dogs go to the podcast share this week's podcast link it's in the highlights share with people and just write on a hashtag founded fetched it 100 um and we will pick one person who shares it in between this episode and next week's episode and send them a free mug. Thank you all again for listening in. Please review, please subscribe, and we shall see you all next week for our 101st episode of Found It Fetched It. Goodbye. That's a wrap on today's episode of Found It Fetched It. Thanks for listening. If you found our conversation valuable, please could you do us a favour and subscribe and leave a review so other people just like me and you can find the podcast. For the ladies out there who are passionate about gun dog training and want more tips, live sessions and a community that gets it, you're welcome to join our membership. Just visit www.thelwdg.com to learn more. Until next time, keep working with your gun dog and take care.